This podcast is brought to you by Al Jazeera. He met her in the fall. He took her to a movie. And when they done it all, he took her Hello and welcome to the Fabulous Pitchy Show. I'm Amanda Palmer. And this week we're joined by Palestinian filmmaker Najwa Najjar for a screening of her first ever feature, acclaimed first feature, Pomegranates and Myrrh. It's a film packed with girl power. On both sides of the camera. She's got the spirits and the guts of, you know, the Palestine that I know. And later, what does a Peruvian girl really want on her wedding day? A dancing chair? Or a golden bear? Vamos, estoy acá, o sea que es posible, no? But first, The Painting Happy Tears by late pop artist Roy Lichtenstein sold for about $7 million a few years ago. And now his son Mitchell has a new film that's also called Happy Tears and is also a work of rare beauty. Why don't you dig up that treasure and buy that nurse a new car? Because I'm going to leave that for you girls after I die. Happy Tears is a story of two very different sisters who dutifully return home to look after their dementia-riddled father. I just asked you if you had to go to the bathroom. I'm going to take it out of here. Oh, Daddy. Come on, let's go. With Rip Torn as the father, the sisters are played by indie queen Parker Posey. Get a move on. That means you too. And straying from her usual Hollywood territory superstar, Demi Moore. Can you just be still? Let's pull them down, all right? She's got an incredible sort of back catalogue of, of films that she's done, but this particular role, it was just so real in many ways. You better get used to it because I'm out of here day after. You got the wrong man. That is what, you know, kind of made me excited to cast her in it. She, as it turns out, was also eager to kind of break the brand of Demi Moore and play this kind of really non unglamorous and real person. What are you laughing at? Because she fell in love with a faggot. <laughs> He likes to call him that because Laurent enjoys cooking and gardening. I think the thing I identify with the most is, is I think in my own family dynamic, I am very much a caretaker. He waves his hands around like a fat man. <laughs> but he's not. <laughs> not at all. I think it's n no accident in Mitchell's choice of casting. He's in the sewer. <laughs> I mean, I think that he really was looking for certain qualities and at the same time yeah. looking for people um, looking for actors that that he really could have, um, ha have explore something that's also very different Demi Moore made her name as a charter member of the 1980s acting Brat Pack and her biggest hit was Ghost Sam can you feel me with all my heart but her biggest payday was strip tease for which she reportedly earned 12 and a half million dollars at the time a record for an actress I need the money I need to get out of here and live a normal fully dressed life while Demi was exposing her talents in the big studio films Parker Posey became queen of the indies not get listening ribbon. to you she's no she's freaking well, out well get the busy bee you want your busy bee including a series of comedic turns in director Christopher Guest's merry mockumentaries it should be in the crate it's not in the crate I just told you that God, But Parker welcomed me onto her indie turf with open arms. You know your sister over there? She must have put me in an old people warehouse. I just saw her as my sister immediately, and I think she me too. And it was, um, we both had uh, strong affections for who we were playing. California? Mm-hmm, me and Jackson. I'll never set foot in that state again, so. <laughs> Living there is out of question. Well, it's not safe for you to live alone anymore. She would be laughing on set. She's like, oh, she's like, God, I, I don't really laugh in my movies. And here she is very, like, one of the most savvy people I've ever met. She's not a nurse, Daddy. Mm -hmm. I think the need to really work as a team is always essential, but when you're on an independent film, you've got to really come together to make it happen. She stole Mommy's opal pendant. Who says I didn't give it to her? I do. Why? <laughs> For services rendered. Uh... The film is a mix of happy tears and not so happy tears. Why are you doing this, Joe? A sort of metaphorical heirloom from a painting by Mitchell's famous pop artist father, Roy Lichtenstein. 
Tell me about that piece of work, if you would, and just give me a description in your own words. Early 60s cartoon of a woman, you know, woman's close-up of a woman's face with her hands up, crying, but smiling. It seemed it, that was the perfect title to yeah. me for the movie. She's gone. And who says I can't give it to Shelley or any other woman if I want to? Peru has never been renowned as a filmmaking hotspot, but at this year's Berlin Film Festival, a Peruvian film pulled off a huge surprise by taking the top award, The Golden Bear. Pasen por aquí, tenemos más ataúdes. Este es para los fanáticos, mira. Para los deportistas. Aquí para los patriotas. Por Dios y por la patria. Claudia Yosa's Milk of Sorrow tells the story of Fausta. Who's on a mission to give her mother a proper funeral. Fausta suffers from an affliction that, according to local folklore, was passed on from her mother during breastfeeding. It's known as the milk of sorrow. And it's said to be common amongst women who were raped during Peru's guerrilla warfare in the 1980s and 90s. People say, look, that kid has the scared breast. It's a very strong name, it's intense, it's poetic. But at the same time, it shocks you. Yosa's main resource for her script was her leading actor, Margalie Solier. A non-professional whom she discovered in the Andes. I put a lot of myself into the writing process. I help them write and translate from the Quechuan language. I've told them stories from my culture. That's why they pay me. <laughs> I've always wanted to make a film about emotions. How do we live with what's left with pain? He talks about the emotions and how to combat them. How that pain comes down from generation to generation. Hoy hablaré con este acto. Hemos confirmado que la máxima es digna para el matrimonio, don Lúcido. Y eso que trajimos una papa bien nudosa, bien difícil, señor. El cine peruano. The Peruvian film industry is struggling to develop and to improve. We make 10 to 15 films a year. But the link between film to film, director to director, is still very weak. Entre director y director son como espaciados. Muy lejanos. We are present in very few festivals. And at age 33, Yosa won a stunning victory this year's Berlin Film Festival, where Milk of Sorrow took the top prize. Vamos, estoy acá, o sea que es posible, no? In part two, we're screening Pomegranates and Myrrh. I have the lovely Palestinian filmmaker Najwa Najjar here. And you made a film in a pretty difficult place. Yeah, we, we shot in the West Bank and uh, Ramallah, the surrounding villages, and in Jerusalem. Not only did you make the film, direct the film, you also wrote the film, and it's a very interesting subject. I wouldn't expect this. In this case, it's um, uh, a love triangle between one woman who becomes the wife of a prisoner and uh, a choreographer who takes her place in the dance. OK, we're going to find out what inspired the love triangle, the idea for your love triangle, in part two. He met her in the fall. Hello everybody, welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. Could I please introduce the wonderful Najwa Najjar for this special screening of Pomegranates and Myrrh. <laughs> We've been following your career for many years now, Najwa, so it's a huge pleasure to have you here. Tell us about your film. I'm so happy to be here and um, to present Pomegranates and Myrrh. According to ancient uh, Arab proverbs, there is in every pomegranate that one seed that comes from heaven. So pomegranates for all the sweetness in life, and myrrh, or in Arabic it's mur, which is bitterness, for all the bitterness. And that one seed from heaven, it's hope. So I hope you enjoy this. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. <laughs> Six years in the making, Pomegranates and Myrrh is a truly Palestinian feature film. 
We wanted to be Palestinian producers in the film. So um, we went to institutions in Palestine and initially that was a little bit difficult because they have, there are so many incredibly demanding needs that come in living in such a difficult situation. When you come and you say you want to do a film, in many ways it's considered a luxury. But we insisted that this is culture and it needs to be supported. Najwa wanted an all-Palestinian cast. She found her leading lady in Yasmin Al-Masri. A rising star who found fame in the Lebanese hit Caramel. Here, Al-Masri plays Kamar, the bride of landowner Zaid, played by newcomer Ashraf Farah. Their marital bliss is soon shattered by Israeli soldiers who come to confiscate Zaid's land and then arrest him. Ali Suleiman, famous for his role in the Oscar-nominated Paradise Now, plays Kais. A dance teacher who provides distraction for Kamar when Zaid is locked up. The 30 day shoot across 42 locations with 40 odd crew negotiating the territory's 650 checkpoints all adds up to a first feature that's a triumph <laughs> over the many obstacles to filming in an occupied territory. But it's not an overtly political story. You take all of this and you make a movie made in Palestine, a Palestinian story that talks about people. I don't have to show you the Intifada. and I do it in another way. We first met Najwa three years ago when she brought her short film, Yasmin's Song, to the Berlin Film Festival. Yasmin! Berlin was very, very important for me because they had a wall and the wall was removed. We followed her to Ramallah and another wall. The occupation affects filmmaking in the way that you're always subject to make films about the occupation. And then to Cannes, where she sought funding for Pomegranates and Myrrh, which would become her first feature. <laughs> then to auditions in London. And to the world premiere of Pomegranates and Myrrh at the Dubai Film Festival. Here we are in this huge theatre and the actors are seeing it for the first time and, and everybody was was waiting and, and, and the emotions were so high. And then the movie ends. Beautiful, beautiful. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people. Everybody's coming up to you and, and, and it's, it's a bit overwhelming. And finally to Ramallah in the West Bank where Najwa hosted a special screening for local residents. <laughs> As you know, we rarely see Palestinian families portrayed in this light, but we rarely see Palestinian Christian families who are a minority, certainly in Palestine, aren't they? Which really, for me, is an incredibly strong message that this conflict is not about Muslim versus Jew, is it? It's not a conflict between religions. It is a conflict about land. They happen to be Christian because the society happens to be made up of, of both, regardless of the percentages at the moment. And it was very important for me, uh, more so, that this is a national conflict. You know, it's a conflict about land, regardless of religion. I love the scene where Kamar actually goes back to that land and she touches the olive tree so she gets that smell. So that when she goes back to her husband in prison, mm. she asks him to, to smell her hand and that's, mm. that was so moving for me. Ahmed. Palestinians losing their land, it's not just it's a loss of land. It's when you lose your land, you lose your livelihood. You lose your identity. There's no reason why people should lose their homes. And you need to live with dignity. I mean, simply, it's not just living, it's living with dignity. And you can only do that on your land. <laughs> فكر فينا فكر بالارض اللي ضلت
بصراحة المدعشة. And who did you talk to 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 help you recreate those scenes? These were some of the toughest interviews. I um, there is one who was in administrative detention. He was the longest person held in it. His name is Ahmed Qatamish. One of the questions was, "What is it that you're waiting for when your wife or comes to visit you?" And he says, "I dream." about that second when our fingers touch at the fence. Oh. And it was, like, it was so emotional for me. <laughs> this is what they dream about. I mean, it wasn't the walls that bothered them. It was not being denied this touch. Mostly. And it's just giving him something to survive in when he's in prison. You know, giving that sense of, of smell, of hear, of touch. So. Yeah. Which is also linked to the fact that he is willing to to forfeit his freedom to secure his land. He doesn't want to get out of jail if it means losing his no. land. No, he won't do it. Ashraf. Ashraf, yes, Ashraf Farah. What a star. <laughs> <laughs> he broke a few hearts, huh? <laughs> he broke a few hearts in here today, didn't he, ladies? So let's talk briefly about the Palestinian cast. Two of those faces I'd seen before. Yes. Obviously, um, Yasmin, who plays Kamar, yes. and obviously we've seen Kais as Kais. well from In Paradise Now. But we hadn't seen Ashraf before, and he's yeah. a he's a real special find, yes. isn't he? Yes. Today, the last day of the war, you could be anyone. Yasmin is a Palestinian. She was born in Lebanon and um, she lives in Paris. And it was Yasmin's first time entering the country. And Ashraf Farah had only done theater. All these actors are all professional actors and all very, very well known in the country. And so he's the only one who hasn't appeared on. And so everybody was like, Are you sure? It's like, Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Look at him. When could they? Clyde Minute to Dreep. Will Bellet cannot fraud you. I can feel left for Dula Taxi. But if she's feeling. The scene with Um Habib. For me, that's one of my favorite scenes. Mm. And the tension probably is probably one of the strongest points in the film. Would, am I am I overstating that? Did you feel that? She is just full of the sort of guts that, that we all want to have in, in every facet of life. She's got the spirits and the guts of, you know, the Palestine that I know. How often does that kind of stoush exist? How many Um Habibs well, do you get yelling at well, look, soldiers it's, like it's, that? We do have a gun up against our head. I mean, it is. But you do find people who sit there and, you know, you see young boys who come up and they push up their chest against them, women who yell and people who come. It is there. It's not like it doesn't exist. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Hi, Um Habib Cafe. No war. Timit. Now they have orders shoot to kill. So when it's shoot to kill, it becomes a little bit less. Uh, but that doesn't mean that. Everybody's not thinking it. <laughs> that not everybody, everybody doesn't feel it inside. It doesn't mean that the society has become pacified. I visited the West Bank a couple of times last year. I felt you caught very well the way people walk constantly, day by day that knife edge between resistance and dignity and survival. I think it's a really important film and I think it's a very much an unreported story. When you read it, some, some of the reviews of Najwa's films, and they're always divided and you expect that. You'd expect that with every film reviewer, but they really even talked about the political stuff. They talked about why didn't Najwa illustrate the, the love triangle more. Even that in itself, you are, you have a responsibility to your region mm. to not tell us everything about the love triangle. If you want to think that the love triangle is because it was not possible, you would be wrong. You need to live your life only once. I'm not going to be able to do In Ramallah, this made a huge controversy because some of the people who watched it there saw it in a much different light. And I was, like, I was on stage and I thought, that's how you see it. 
you know, if maybe I don't, maybe that's not what I intended or what she thinks or what he thinks. Maybe this is not, but because it is ambiguous and I don't want to spoon feed. Everybody in the world has been spoon fed enough. What do you think? <laughs> You said in the introduction that you wanted to give people a sense of hope yes. with this, the pomegranates. Mm. But now, I this year, when we've had a war, mm. you know, on Gaza, where's mm. the hope? Um, I mean, it's, it's precisely because of this war in Gaza uh, and because of the situation we live that I thought that to make such a movie would be important. I mean, Gaza's kind of a difficult, difficult now situation because it was completely devastated. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. I don't know where people now have the energy to survive, to get up, to resist. And as long as people are willing to continue life, then you know that the struggle won't end. The worst thing is to give up. So maybe the hope is, is that, is that continuation. Let's thank, please, Nantwan Ajar for bringing her film Pomegranates and Myrrh. Well, that's it for this fabulous picture show. And Nantwan, you know what they forgot to mention? Hmm. Your Scorsese moment, the cameo. Yeah. That was you, right? That was me. Dancing at the wedding. That was a lot of fun. You mm. thought you got off lightly, didn't you? Yes, I did. I thought nobody would notice it. But we're going to show <laughs> it, just in case you missed it as well. <laughs> Join us next time on The Fabulous Feature Show. See you then. On a scale of 1 to 10, what would you give this film and why? I think I'd give it between an 8 and a 9 because I cannot remember the last time my heart was beating so fast. I think what the film did portray very well was the metal of the Palestinian people. It's not about suicide bombing, it's not about chanting names of God. It's freedom and hope, actually, how to have a hope that there is something that can be done. Mm -hmm.